On the 18th of June, 1815, the fields near the towns of Mont-Saint-Jean and Waterloo in modern-day Belgium witnessed a clash of empires. It was the Battle of Waterloo, the epic showdown between the indomitable French army, led by Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, and the combined forces of the Seventh Coalition. After returning from exile in a desperate bid to reclaim his empire during the Hundred Days, Napoleon faced the steadfast opposition of the Anglo-Allied army under Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, and the relentless Prussian forces commanded by Field Marshal Gebhard Leberecht von Blücher. The fate of nations hung in the balance as Napoleon's forces fought fiercely, aiming to crush the Allied army. The battle raged on with the capture of La Haye Sainte and moments of near victory, but destiny had other plans. Join us on a journey back in time, to the heart of one of history's most pivotal moments. Witness the bravery, the strategy, and the sheer determination that shaped the world as we know it today. This is the story of the Battle of Waterloo. On March 20th, 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte triumphantly entered Paris, carried to the Tuileries Palace by enthusiastic crowds of French citizens. Less than a year earlier, he had abdicated the French imperial throne after his defeat in the War of the Sixth Coalition and was exiled to the Mediterranean island of Elba. However, discontent with the Bourbon Restoration led to widespread unrest. Exploiting this, Napoleon returned to France, swiftly gaining support from defecting soldiers. This marked the start of his second reign, known as the Hundred Days. The great powers of Europe, wary of Napoleon's return, formed the Seventh Coalition and mobilized against him. The coalition planned to send armies to Belgium, threatening northeastern France. Napoleon, aware of their intentions, seized the opportunity to launch his own offensive before the coalition armies could unite. He concentrated his forces near the Belgian frontier, aiming for a surprise attack. Napoleon's strategy involved capturing the crucial crossroads at Quatre-Bras to keep the coalition army separated. Despite facing resistance, he managed to split his army into different parts, with Marshal Ney leading an assault at Quatre-Bras. The battle ended in a draw, but Napoleon's forces had successfully engaged the enemy. Simultaneously, the Battle of Ligny unfolded, where Napoleon sought to eliminate the Prussian army. Although the French forces broke the Prussian line, miscommunications prevented a decisive victory. The Prussians retreated to Wavre, allowing Napoleon to focus on his next target. On June 17, 1815, Napoleon, displaying unusual lethargy, finally acted. He dispatched Marshal Grouchy to pursue the retreating Prussians and planned to join Ney at Quatre Bras to confront Wellington's army. However, delays and unfavorable weather hampered Napoleon's progress. By dawn on June 18, 1815, the French and Allied armies stood facing each other near the village of Waterloo. The field was small, but both sides were prepared for a decisive battle. Napoleon's army, although experienced, had fragile morale, while Wellington's multinational force held a defensive position on the Mont-Saint-Jean ridge. The outcome of the battle depended on whether the Prussians could reach Waterloo in time to reinforce Wellington's army and counter Napoleon's forces led by Marshal Ney. In the early hours of the fateful day, Napoleon, the brilliant military strategist, gathered his high-ranking officers at his headquarters in Le Caillou. During this meeting, Prince Jerome Bonaparte, his brother, relayed crucial information overheard from British officers. These tidings hinted at Blucher's intention to come to Wellington's aid, a pivotal piece of intelligence that could sway the course of the impending battle. However, Napoleon, perhaps overconfident and dismissive of the report, waved it off as mere gossip. Ignoring the advice of his officers, he downplayed the capabilities of his opponent, the Duke of Wellington, whom he had never encountered on the battlefield before. This underestimation of the enemy's strength would later prove to be a costly miscalculation. As the clock struck 11 a.m., the battleground came alive with the thunderous roar of artillery fire from French General Ryle's two corps. 
the French forces began their assault on the Allied line, aiming to weaken their defences and create openings for further advances. Simultaneously, a diversionary attack was launched on the Hougoumont farmhouse, intending to draw the attention of the defending Hanover and Nassau troops. However, this seemingly minor diversion escalated into a brutal struggle, with the defenders proving more resilient than anticipated. The Hougoumont diversion, instead of being a quick tactic, turned into a protracted and bloody conflict, keeping Ryla's corps engaged throughout the day. Napoleon's artillery barrage, intended to inflict significant damage on the Allies, fell short of its goal. Most of Wellington's troops were strategically positioned behind the ridge, shielded from the cannon fire. The soft, rain-soaked ground further dampened the impact, preventing cannonballs from bouncing and causing widespread destruction. Undeterred by the initial setbacks, Napoleon ordered Count Delon's I Corps to ascend the ridge and break the Allied line. Delon's troops, numbering in the thousands, advanced in a formation that, although massive, proved unwieldy and vulnerable. As the French soldiers maneuvered through chest-high rye fields, they became easy targets for Wellington's artillery. Despite heavy losses, the French divisions inched closer to the Allied positions, engaging in fierce combat near key locations like La Haye Sainte, Frischemont and Papelotte. Amidst this turmoil, news arrived that three Prussian corps were approaching Napoleon's right flank. Blücher, the Prussian commander, had successfully outmaneuvered Grouchy, a French general left behind to fend off the Prussian threat. This strategic move allowed over 48,000 Prussian soldiers to march to Wellington's aid, putting additional pressure on Napoleon's forces. Recognizing the growing urgency of the situation, Napoleon made a critical decision to focus on defeating the Anglo-Allied army before the Prussians could intervene effectively. However, his plan hinged on breaking through the Allied center before the Prussian reinforcements arrived in full force. Napoleon entrusted Marshal Ney with a crucial task, capturing La Haye Sainte, a farmhouse near the Allied center. Despite Ney's attempt to lead a coordinated attack, the French cavalry charge was slowed by the soggy ground. This delay provided the Allies with precious moments to form defensive squares, a tactic that proved effective against the charging French horsemen. The battlefield resounded with the thunder of cannons and muskets as the French cavalry's assault met a formidable wall of British bayonets and deadly field guns. Undeterred by the initial failure, Napoleon persisted. At 6 p.m., Ney launched another assault, successfully capturing La Haye Sainte. This victory allowed the French to establish a deadly firing position perilously close to the heart of the Allied line. With the Allies under intense pressure, Napoleon seized what he perceived to be the opportune moment to strike the decisive blow. At 7 p.m., he ordered his most elite troops, the Imperial Guard, to advance. These battle-hardened soldiers, numbering close to 4,000, marched forward with great determination. However, amidst the chaos of battle, the charge fragmented into two separate columns possibly due to confusion or miscommunication. This division allowed Wellington to focus his defences on each column separately. The Imperial Guard's advance was met with a barrage of artillery fire and musket volleys from the Allies. Wellington, recognising the critical nature of the moment, ordered a general charge with fixed bayonets. The disciplined Allied soldiers, fortified by their leader's unwavering resolve, repelled the Imperial Guard's advance with devastating efficiency. The cry, La Garde recule, the Guard is retreating, echoed across the battlefield, marking a rare moment of French defeat. Simultaneously, the Prussian forces broke through the French defences at Plassenois, shattering the illusion of French invincibility. The combination of relentless pressure from the Allies and the Prussian breakthrough proved insurmountable for Napoleon's forces. By the end of the day, the Battle of Waterloo had exacted a heavy toll on both sides. The French suffered between 25,000 to 33,000 casualties, 
while the Allied losses amounted to 24,000. This bloody conflict marked the downfall of Napoleon's empire. Just four days after the battle, Napoleon abdicated for the final time, marking the end of his rule. He was subsequently sent into permanent exile on the remote island of St. Helena, where he would live out the rest of his days until his death in 1821. Furthermore, the Battle of Waterloo held profound historical significance. It not only concluded the Napoleonic Wars, but also ushered in a new era of power dynamics in Europe. The victorious Allies established a system known as the Concert of Europe, a framework designed to maintain a balance of power among the major European nations. This arrangement would shape European politics for the decades that followed, ensuring a period of relative stability after the tumultuous years of conflict under Napoleon's rule.